to turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. And uh, we'll read verses 19 through 26. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Starting at verse 19. Yep, when you find that, stand uh, for the reading of God's word. And we'll read uh, Acts chapter 19, or 11, verse 19 through uh, verse 26. This is what it says. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him into, unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Father, we're grateful. Lord, we pray that you give us a good time in your word tonight. And Lord, just help us, Lord, to be strengthened and encouraged again, uh, as I mentioned in my prayer at the beginning of the service, that we would be encouraged and strengthened and, and uh, be made known to realize, Lord, what, are, what task lies ahead of us? And so, Lord, help us to be strengthened and encouraged through your word. And, uh, Lord, we're thankful for this time that we can come together and, uh, Lord, be equipped, Lord, through your word. So just bless us tonight, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm to do my uh, introduction a little bit different tonight. And I want to, uh, we had touched on a a uh, timeline last week, and uh, so I want to touch on that a little bit. I want to hand you out a a, a, a a little printout. I think we got an opportunity to do the keys. One of these.
ascension. And then, of course, as you look at that, the next big major event that we talked about quite a bit is, of course, you might know what this one's called. Somebody talk to me. Yeah, he's going to meet us in the sky. Anybody know where that's at in the Bible? Yeah, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4. Or 1 Corinthians. Anybody know where it's at in 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 12. All right. And, uh, and so that's where we're at. Now, do we know where we're at in our timeline? Of course, we know the ascension took place. And then we got a space in here that we can call, well, they got it on here. He's got it on as the church age. We'll leave it as that. Nothing wrong with that. We'll call it the church age. Where do you think we are in, in this timeline? As far as, sorry, David, you're not able to see. Where do you think we are in this timeline? We have the beginning shortly after the ascension. This is the church age right here. Here's just before the rapture. Where are we at? Are we, are we closer to this side or are we closer to this side? I'd say right side. Yeah, we're getting close to over here. Time's getting short. And, uh, and uh, this also, and I won't deal with much of what's in this, but uh, it also talks about signs. Shows you on there where signs stopped. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because we got an attack on our uh, on the nation going on. I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but it, it, if if it's allowed to take place um, with with uh, with what's going on in our in our Congress and what's being proposed, anybody know what's being proposed on the on the far uh, left liberal side? There's they got what's called something. It's called the. Have you ever heard of the Green New Deal? This is some crackpot, goofy. Young Congresswoman has proposed, she hasn't even been in the Congress um, for probably a month, and uh, she's got this big grandiose idea called the Green New Deal. Anybody know what it's about? What's the Green New Deal proposing? First thing it says is, as I talked last week, she says, this is, uh, her name is uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And uh, they call her AOC for short. And uh, she's a crackpot. She's a goofball. And uh, she's, she's telling everybody that if we don't do something, our world's going to come to an end. Anybody know how many years? Twelve. Twelve years. Our world's going to come to an end. Now, I showed us last week. Now, when we look at this, yes, this makes us realize that, man, time is, you know, time is ticking on. And if we're, if we're towards the end of the end times and the rapture happens, um, yeah, we're getting towards the end of the, uh, of, uh, of the timeline as far as Christians are concerned. But I also showed us that even if the rapture was to happen, if the rapture took place tonight, yep, how long would we have, according to the Bible, how long would this earth still take on as it is? In, in a sense, as far as it's not going to end, it's not just going to explode, it's not just going to burn up, um, it's going to go at least 1,007 years. That's allowing for uh, the biblical uh, term millennial reign, and as well as the seven years tribulation. And, uh, but what Ocasio-Cortez says is this world, if we don't do something, um, What's going to happen is this world's going to come to an end in 12 years. Now, she's proposing a Green New Deal. Does anybody know what the Green New Deal is about? I do. What's it about? They say that like, there won't be any more cars. Yep, so that's, let's take it one at a time. So she proposes that what we need to do to stop this world from, from exploding or disintegrating or, or burning up in 12 years, we need to... Do away with all cars. What else? Cows. Yep. No cows. No cows. No, no more air travel. Yep. 
No planes. I mean, that's just the start. Three things. No cars, no cows, no planes. Now, what's funny is a lot of them, a, a lot of people are coming out to counter this and saying, even, even Greenpeace, you ever heard of Greenpeace? Even they're saying that, you know, this moron, if she does this, if they propose this, what people will do if they can't, if they can't, uh, uh, if they can't, because she's talking about also doing away with all fossil fuels, so no fuel of any kind, he said the first thing that's going to happen is, uh, this is the Greenpeace guy, everybody's going to start destroying all the trees, you know, all the tree yards. They're going to start destroying all the trees to heat their houses and all that way. And so none of that's been taken into account. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because it sounds ridiculous. But you know what they do? They'll, they'll propose something that's just totally way out there in left field. So that they can get something that's a little bit closer. And so what I'm saying is, what you're seeing here, I believe is you're seeing what's going to eventually happen as a hostile takeover. Well, and I know this sounds crazy, but if they start proposing that they're going to limit how many cars you can have, doesn't that sound like a, a, a communist country where they start telling you what you can do, what you can have, how much you can have? And, and so what we're looking at is what's the Bible say about, about the end times? There's going to be a time before, I believe, even the rapture happens, where people are going to turn away from the Word of God. Is that true? Hey, Amen. Already have They'll have, and they're already working on it, aren't they? And so what's going on is you're seeing, I think, something that could be playing into all of this. You're seeing a society, a nation, who basically is being turned away from God. And if those that don't turn away from God, what's going to happen is they're going to be put under control. And what you're seeing is almost like, have you ever heard that during the tribulation, um, you won't be able to buy stuff unless you take a mark? You ever heard of that? Yeah. It's in the Bible. Now, do you know what this is? It's kind of the same thing. To where they're going to start controlling what you buy, what you use, and what you do. You see now, um, this all kind of plays into what I'm going to preach on tonight. And so if you would, again, look at uh, Acts chapter 11. And uh, you probably remember me a few years ago. Um, I stumbled on a little devotional writing uh, in the Baptist bread. And it spurred me on to make a comparison. And uh, we've talked about this. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. About just because uh, we're born again, if we become Christians, does that make us disciples? Or I should say, if we get saved, does that make us disciples? And if we become disciples, does that necessarily make us Christians? And you probably remember me uh, uh, talking about uh, that little, uh, it just got me thinking, the Baptist bread when I looked at it. Um, I, I had done a sermon and the three points were really this since being born again um, how, how the process of following the Lord works is that since being born again uh, when we get saved we have to determine whether we're going to follow Christ or not and if we'll follow Christ according to the scriptures that will make us a disciple uh, you've seen my definition of a, of a disciple before in John he talk, he's talking to the Jews at that time. And he says, if you follow my words, you'll be my disciples indeed. And so if we're Christians and we follow his word, in other words, well, that's what we do. We take the Bible and uh, we learn what God wants us to do and how God wants us to grow to be like him. And, and we try to follow him. We try to follow his word. We try to make his, uh, his Bible, his word, uh, part of our faith and practice. And so that, be, that makes us disciples. But then I also preached a, a message, that, that same message, and I said, uh, but uh, after being born again and determining to follow Christ, which promotes me to be a disciple, 
Um, it doesn't necessarily, according to the way he was using his terms in that Baptist bread, it doesn't necessarily make me a Christian. Everybody says they're a Christian today. And a lot of people say, well, as long as I, I agree with God, then that makes me a Christian. Well, that's not the gospel. But what I'm saying is I, I believe, um, let me say it again. We can be born again and determined to follow Christ. That will make us his disciple. And what I believe uh, promotes us from being a disciple to, to being promoted to Christian is that when we endure as a disciple, that means we follow his ways despite um, the, the opposition that we face. Because there's a lot of people who will follow for a while, but when they face the, uh, opposition, then they stop following. And now I don't believe you, uh, you, you lose your salvation, but can you really call yourself a Christian? Because a Christian is a follower, a Christ follower. How do you know that? Well, that's what we're going to look at tonight. And uh, we're going to look at this term uh, tonight. And we're going to realize that we flagrantly in our world today use Christian very flagrantly. And people need to realize that when they call themselves a Christian, there's something that should go with that. And uh, so that's what we're going to look at. And so, so what I want to do is I want to take this a little bit farther. And that leads me to tonight's message. And, and Christian is mentioned, and I've mentioned this before. The term Christian is mentioned only three times in the Bible. And with each time, it had specific implications. And these mentions, if we look at them, help us to understand what a Christian is. Now, the three mentions are right where we're at, Acts 11, in Acts 26, and then again in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. And so we're going to look at those tonight, and, uh, and, and it's going to kind of play in with what we're looking at here on our, on our uh, dry erase board. And so let's uh, look at verse 26 in Acts chapter 11, where we're at, and look what it says again. It says, when he had found, uh, found him... He brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, the first implication here is that Christian uh, was a derogatory title, not a, an, an assigned uh, trophy, so to speak. In other words, when you look at verse uh, 26, you need to understand that, that they weren't, that Christ followers didn't get together and were trying to decide what we're going to call our little club. Hey man, that's the kind of sense we have today, is that when people use Christian today, they use it as, like, this is what we're going to call our club. But that's not what it was back then. Um, the name Christian back then was given to Mark um, this radical group. In other words, it was given to them. They didn't pick it. Um, they were. They, it was given to them. See that what was going on here is the heathen, the heathen population in Antioch, in order to identify and separate these new fanatical, radical followers of Christ from the worshipers of Caesar. Uh, uh, Caesar. They named them Christians. You see what I'm saying? Uh, Christians didn't name themselves. It was because they were following Christ and Christ's radical religion, they were called Christians. Is that what it says here? It says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And by the way, you as Christians are being tagged and sorted out as we speak. What do you mean? Well, when I so show you this, um, uh, we have allowed some Islamic, so to speak, and I, I believe this, I believe there are Islamic terrorists into our Congress. And it happens to be two women. It does. And, uh, and they haven't been a month uh, in, in the Congress, and some of the stuff that's going on is just crazy. Like a quote by a, a Michigan Congresswoman, her name's Rashida Tlaib, um, she ran, by the way, did you know how she got in? Anybody know how she got in? Was anybody running against her? No. She just walked in. She ran unopposed. Came in as a radical, Islamic, left-wing 
you know, Democrat, and now nobody opposed her. There was no party to oppose her. And so, what did she have to have? One vote? I don't know. And so, isn't it amazing? And then as soon as she gets in, she basically, you know, talks about impeaching our president in, in not in nice terms in front of a public crowd. And then she says this. She made, she, by the way, when she was sworn in, she was sworn in with her hand over a Quran. Cor, uh, I mean, that's their Islamic Bible. And uh, then what she did is, is part of her prayer, I believe it was, or in part of a speech, she said, we need Allah to give us light on the issues. And, and by the way, I don't know if you know anything about Allah. I had Bible professors who didn't. I had a Bible professor at Heartland Baptist Bible College who, when I basically got up and did a, did a research paper on Islam, I said, there's one thing that I appreciate, appreciate about Islam. I said, and that is they, took, they take their religion serious. And I, where I was going is we were in a class of, of, there was about three or four clowns in our class. And there was a bunch of married students in there and we all wanted to learn. And there was these young guys in there that were single that were kind of class clowns and they were always cutting up and stuff like that. And it kind of offended me. And so I thought I'd help our professor out when I got up and did my paper and I gave my, uh, my little pre presentation on Islam. And then I said, the one thing that I appreciate about Islam is that they're serious about their religion. Even though it's wrong, they're serious about it. And I said, if they sat in a class like this trying to learn about their God, like we're supposed to be learning. And I said, they had, a, and we had a little group of, of cut-ups in our class. And I said, if they had a little group of cut-ups like this, I said, they'd march them right out into the courtyard and cut their heads off. And, and, and the guys that I sat with in the back were you know, more or less laughing about it. And I said, maybe that's what we need to do in our class to get things a little bit more serious and take things a little bit more serious. I said, maybe we need to march some of these guys out that don't take class seriously and march them out and lop their heads off. And then I just picked up my papers and I went and sat down. And so my professor came up, and uh, he didn't know what to say. And so he says, well, he said, you know, and what he was doing is just, uh, just basically uh, patting them little boys on the back. He said, well, you know, we, we wouldn't do that. And he, said, and he said, besides that, you know, we serve the same God that Islam serves. Their Allah is our God. And I thought, oh, my goodness. Because... Because if you do a little bit of study on who Allah is, um, Allah is Muhammad's, which Muhammad, of course, is, is, uh, is all Islam's little prophet. He's, he be, he, they compare him to like Abraham of our Bible. He's, Muhammad is like their Abraham of their Bible. Of course, they, they, they give homage, they pay homage to Abraham too. But they look at Muhammad as their, their prophet and Allah was nothing more than, than Muhammad's fake moon god. And he's a, he's a sat satanic representation of a deity. And so what I'm saying is when we look at this, and we look at us being given the name Christian, and we look at that, you know what? Even today, you're being, you're being sorted out. You might not realize it, but you're being sorted out. And we're coming to a day where you're going to have to decide whether you're going to be a Christian or not. And so, so a Christian would not have been thought of of a, of a term of endearment where we see here in Acts chapter 11. They would have had the same attitude as many throughout the Bible had of these radical God followers. And, and many of the same that today. Uh, remember Haman and Esther. Now they weren't Christians back in the Old Testament, but they were God followers. And you remember Haman, he said, that, you know, he told his king that their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. And so what they wanted to do is lop their heads off. Now, what I'm getting at is, is just as you said, you know, where are, we, where are we on our timeline? This church age, we don't know how long it's going to last before the rapture happens. And we don't know what's going to happen here. This new deal and all that you see coming up. Um, can I say it again? Is it getting better or worse? Oh my goodness. 
I mean, we got a, a, a 15 year old. I'm not, 16, yeah, you're 16 now. 16 year old. That, you know, because I used to say to everybody, since you've been born, is the world getting better or worse? And 99.9, .9, I've never, I don't think I've had anybody say it's better. Now, you can look at maybe personally and say, well, I got a job now. I'm doing better than what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking the overall look at the world and, and, and world going into immorality, world going away from God. Is it getting better or getting worse? Worse. Absolutely worse. And so what I'm saying is, is we're getting near here, I would hope. I pray. Even so, Lord Jesus, come, is what we should be saying. Because what's happening is this right here. I don't know what this is going to materialize into. I mean, I'm hearing already people saying, man, if, if, you know, if Trump doesn't get voted back in, because there's a lot of people out there saying he's our only hope. Because if they let that radical bunch like that, because all this is, 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 this isn't just socialism. This is communism. Is what it is. What we're going to come under is strong arm rule, is what it's headed toward. If something doesn't stop it. And, uh, and, and I'm not saying I can tell you what the time frame is. I'm not saying when, I can tell you when the rapture is going to happen. All I can say is, man, we just have to gear up and, and, and just, you know, grit our teeth and continue to serve the Lord. Continue to, to be Christians. And to serve him. Because we're, we're heading near that great fall away. I'm sure of it. Now, now, why would they be called Christians by the tongues folk? Let's figure this out. Why would they? So you're telling us here, Pastor. Look at verse 26 again in your text. It says, and when he, when he had found him, this is Barnabas going to seek out Saul. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I don't believe that's a self-proclaimed. I don't believe that that's them going into a locked up room and saying this is what we're going to call ourselves. I believe because of their practice, because of them following Christ, following God, there were people on the outside looking at them and saying they're Christians. It was not a term of endearment, you see. And why were they being called Christians? Well, because the effect Jesus Christ had on them had made a visible impact on them. And they were different. They were going against the grain, you see. You have many here who are still, uh, by Acts 11, I mean, it mentioned Stephen. Did you notice that when we were reading that? It said uh, early in our scripture there, uh, where we started in uh, verse 19, it says, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about, uh, about Stephen. Does anybody know what happened to Stephen? He was persecuted, right? Stoned in Acts chapter 7. And so here we are in Acts chapter 11. This isn't much later. And what you have is you have a, a persuasion of people who want a certain sect of religion and they're against those that aren't wanting to go in their direction. Can I say it again? There's a certain group of people out there who are, who are involved in their own religion. This is a religion. Socialism, communism is a religion. And they're involved trying to get this world to go their direction. And those who don't are going to be singled out. You see. And it's just like that here. Because these they were, they were on the run in a sense and spreading the gospel. And so why would they be called Christians by the townsfolk? Because of the effect that Christ had on their lives and how they were following and serving Christ. Now, have you ever noticed also Antioch, if you know anything about Antioch, it is a port city, meaning it was right there along the Mediterranean, north, up along the Mediterranean coastline, and it was a port city. And it was hugely diverse. It would have been like, it would have been thinking of like, I, I think of New Orleans all the time. Do you know we have Mardi Gras coming up? Not us. Huh? Well, theirs is, but we have Mardi Gras coming up here. 
And, and I told a pastor this because he had, uh, a pastor had asked me, hey, hey, I've heard about this, uh, this uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day down at your, at your uh, uh, town of Clare. And I said, yeah, it's, I said, I've always looked at it as it's Clare's Mardi Gras. I said, they do the beads, they do all that kind of stuff. You know, the same kind of stuff they do at Mardi Gras. You can see here, it's just on a smaller scale. And he said, well, we, we've been thinking about, you know, and this was last year I was talking to him, you know, uh, maybe like doing something down there, street preaching, passing out tracks, that kind of stuff. I said, yeah, yeah, we can do that, you know, do something like that. And uh, so he just called me, what, a couple nights ago, and said, we'd like to come down and pass out tracks during that parade. And, and he said, we just want to make sure we're not stepping on you, or you can do it with us, or we can do it together, however you want to do it. And I said, yeah, I'd be more than glad to. And I said, you guys do what you want. I said, we haven't really planned anything, but I said, if you don't mind, when you come down, we're, we'd be willing to uh, pass tracks with you and street preach, do whatever we can do. And uh, I don't think they're going to street preach. I think they're just going to walk down to the crowd and pass all tracks. And, um, and so anyway, we got talking about that. And like I said, we're, we're, it's, you know, it, when we think about Antioch and the, being a port city and think about New Orleans and all that went down there and the diversity that's down there, um, that's what was going on in Antioch. And, and just because those people got saved, it, and not only did they just get saved, but also they were a testament. I know a lot of people can say, you mean, you mean people come after? Uh, people name them Christians just because they got saved? No, it's because what they did after they got saved. It's not just because they got saved, but it's because what they did after they got saved. Amen. Well, look what it says. What did they do? Look what it says. It says um, in verse 26, it says, And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. And taught much people. I believe what they were doing is, they were going, is people were just flocking in. And wanting to hear this, this teaching. And just like the Bible says, they were standing that town on its ear. Another part of, of, of that region was being stood on their ear. You see. And so can I say it again? Uh, Christian was a derogatory title, not, a, not an assigned trophy, you see. And the second implication we look at, take it, uh, turn to Acts chapter 26. We'll look at where it's used there also. Acts chapter 26 in uh, verse 28. Here's where it's mentioned again. He says, then Agrippa, and of course we know this is Paul when he's making his rounds during his trial and he's given his testimony to all these governors and to all these uh, um, kings you see verse 28 says then Agrippa said unto Paul almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian and so and so to be called a Christian is to be a persuasive spokesperson not just to have a derogatory title assigned to you but it also, we see what, what got us assigned that is that we're an aggressive, persuasive spokesperson. You see, a Christian, to be a Christian, really has no choice. Amen. Paul's own uh, testimony reveals this. Look back at verse 16, same chapter, verse 26. says, but rise and stand upon thy feet. This is Paul's testimony. And he says, this is what's happened to him. He says, but rise. This is when, when Paul met with Jesus Christ. He says, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Now, uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. That you might say, well, my, my salvation experience wasn't like Paul's. Thank God it wasn't. Thank God you didn't have to see the signs that Paul saw. Remember, Saul Paul, Saul Paul was a Jew. And Jews seek a sign. But we don't have to have a sign. 
But what we also know is that when we get saved, we're not, and you might say, well, I, I wasn't challenged like Paul then uh, to, uh, to uh, both, it says, both, uh, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen uh, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. You know what it says about us? That we're supposed to be a witness to those things of which we have heard. Amen. Of which we've heard. And so, what do you mean heard? Well, when I read my Bible and I get into it, man, I start reading things and then I tell people, did you know this? You know, and so, so you see what it does to us or what we're called to do. We're called to be a Christian, to be a persuasive spokesperson, according to Paul's own testimony. Verse 17 in that same chapter, 26, says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. That's kind of like our God. Amen. We're to be a testimony and witness to those things which we have heard, and then what we do is we tell others. Hopefully to open up their eyes and their ears. You see. And then finally, turn to 1 Peter Man, where did time go? 1 Peter chapter 4 and uh, verse 16. Look at that bottom. By the way, I wanted to show you something about that print I gave you. If you get this ingrained in your mind, it'll help you too. The bottom of that print, this one that I'm talking about right here, if you look at the bottom, it also shows you where our books all fit in in our Bible. And uh, you'll notice that um, from, the, from the church age, from the church age all the way up through Philemon, um, then books, books are specifically to us. And then after the rapture, do you see what the books are? See how it says Hebrews to Revelation? Um, that's a good way to help us. Now, I'm not saying we don't, we can't go into uh, anywhere from Hebrews all the way to Revelation and read them and get some application out of them. But what you'll notice is those books primarily are tribulational books and after. That means after the rapture happens, that's what them are primarily, uh, uh, the first audience is going to be in those those eras, you see. But we can go to them like First Peter, where I told you to turn to. Turn to First Peter and uh, and look at uh, chapter four. First Peter chapter four and verse sixteen. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, now what's a Christian? It's a Christ follower. It's not only a Christ disciple it's a, it follows his word, but it's a Christ endurer. They, they get saved, they follow Christ's word, God's word, and they endure as a disciple. And that makes them a Christian, I believe. And so when you see here, it says again in that verse, verse 16 in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So can I say this also? To be called a Christian is to be, the, uh, be one that sings out even in times of suffering. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, like I said, this is kind of, kind of a, uh, helps us to understand what our task is, is as a Christian. Because we're in this era. But well, we can also see from the examples of someone uh, uh, someone that's going to be in the prime of tribulation, which is in this era, one, uh, it'll be seven years, is how long this will be. Seven years long is what the tribulation will be. And they're being told to endure as a Christian. It says again in that verse, it says, uh, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on, on his behalf. And we saw that even taking place, we won't go through the examples of it, but you see that even taking place in the life of Paul. You probably remember in Acts, we won't turn back there, but in Acts chapter 16, 
Paul and Silas were thrown into prison and they were beaten with many stripes. And what was amazing about it is when they were thrown in prison, rather than crying, woe is me, they were singing praises unto God. Singing to the glory of God. That's exactly what that's talking about. And so, and so our challenge tonight is this. Um, I'm, not right, I'm not putting this timeline up here to scare you. But I'm, I'm putting this timeline up here to show you that this is reality. Something's going on. When we see, when we see the left doing what it's doing, we're headed somewhere. And I mean, we, we've, and there's even, there's many political um, strategists and all that that are looking at what's going on and saying we're in uncharted territory, and there's no turning back. I mean, we're never going to be what we were as far as when it comes to our government. Um, we, have, we have dove off into things that I don't know where it's going to go. I'm hoping it's for the better as far as if we can, hold a, if we can take a hold as Christians and, and stand strong with our, with our conservative stand, I'm hoping we can win out. But no matter what, God tells us what to do. Amen. He tells us, number one, stand, stand out in society no matter what's going on around you. And he tells us to speak out for the Savior no matter what's going on around you. And he tells us to even, just like this last verse, sing out even in time of suffering and give God glory and praise for it. Amen. It's pretty amazing to think about. In closing, listen to this verse. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. He said, For unto you it is given in, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. That's a true Christian. Can I say it again? For unto you it is given into the, uh, in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Amen. Like I said, again, I didn't show you this to scare you. But I'm, I'm showing you uh, basically so that you have, so you're realistic. You know? And like I said, if anything, this stuff lights a fire under me. Because we have a book that tells us, we have a book that's basically our clock. We can look at this and we can know uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the way things are going to come down. This is how things are going to wrap up. Our biggest thing is just knowing exactly when it's going to happen. But Christ says it doesn't matter when it's going to happen. Just be ready no matter what. Amen. Father, we sure are grateful, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. And Lord, we pray that you continue to bless us and grow us closer to you. And Lord, maybe there's someone out here, Lord, who I pray that they're not stressing, Lord, about the things we talked about. And I pray that we also don't take a, uh, a light sight view of the things we're talking about. And that we would just think that, ah, this, this stuff will never happen. No, we know it's going to happen. We can tell just by the things that are going on in the Bible. And, uh, and uh, we don't know exactly time frame, but Lord, we know, according to our timetable, uh, that little print that we got, Lord, we know basically how the major events are going to take place. And we know there's going to be uh, many little uh, battles and uh, many little governmental things going on that's going to push our timeline right along. And uh, Lord, we might be looking at some of that stuff in our government even today. Lord, with these terrorists, these Islamic terrorists coming in uh, to our government and, and uh, calling out against Israel, who are people that we're supposed to stand with. Um, Lord, we're becoming a nation that's uh, much divided. 